Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Beth Castrodale, author of the novel, I Mean You No Harm. Beth, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, I Mean You No Harm, how would you describe the novel? Sure, sure. So it's a work of suspense, but it's also a story of family and of self-discovery. And as the novel starts, the main character, Layla Shawn, has been estranged from her sister, from her father, um, a career criminal for years. And she's also been estranged from her half-sister, Bette. But, um, but the two sisters reconnect at their father's wake. And this is just after Layla has discovered some new clues about who might have been responsible for her mother's unsolved murder. And this happened when she was, was a toddler. And soon after the wake, um, Layla discovers that Bette is seriously ill, yet she's determined to make a cross country road trip that, you know, has seemingly innocent ends. And Layla figures, you know, I've just been laid off from my job. I'll go along and uh, I'll go on, on, along on the trip just to look out for Bette. And, in the course of the trip, the two sisters mend fences, but eventually Layla finds herself in the middle of an unsettled and lethal score between her father and a man who knows more than he should about her mother's death. And toward the end of the, the novel, um, Layla's pushed into a life or death situation, and, and it kind of forces her to make some decisions that would have surprised and probably repulsed her previous self. And she has to come to terms with this new understanding of herself and what she's capable of doing. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing I Mean You No Harm? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, several years ago, I read an essay on The Guardian by a woman who discovered when she was a child that her father was a member of the mob, and it really turned her world upside down. And she had to reconcile his roles as a criminal and a parent. And I decided to write from the point of view of just such a daughter, and that was my main character, Layla. And Layla's really troubled by her father's history, even though she wasn't raised by him. But in contrast to her, her half sister, Bette, was raised by their father. And she seems really, you know, pretty untroubled by his past. And so after Layla and Bette reconnect, they have to, they have to figure out their own relationship apart from their father and also try to reconcile their different perspectives on him. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so I've been writing fiction since I was a kid. And um, like early in elementary school, I started making up stories. And it was mostly um, to entertain myself. And then I just kept going. And, you know, I had some interruptions where I was trying to, you know, get my career going and save some money and so on. And and I was, I honestly, I was a late bloomer when it, get, it came to getting my work published. And for mm-hmm. years, I had this feeling that, you know, my work just isn't good enough. And that kept me from submitting it. And once I began submitting it, you know, I had the usual rounds of re- rejections. And then I got my first acceptances, um, you know, first with short stories and later with novels. And, you know, eventually, um, you know, my first novel was published um, in uh, 2017. Um, so it's been a long journey, but a good one, basically. Well, I'm curious, what prompted you to start submitting? Was there was there a specific uh watershed moment, so to speak? You know, I think what it was, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to get anything published if I don't submit. And, you know, I think some, you know, friends of my writer's group were encouraging, you know, they said, oh, you should send this out. It's it's ready. And so it, it was kind of one of those things where it's just like, okay, you know, um, if I don't do it now, it's, it's never going to happen. And, you know, I think part of it too is the you know, I just thought you're going to get, you, you have to face up to the fact that rejection is just part of the game and you have to just kind of learn to live with that. And, you know, I was able to kind of come to terms with that basically. Sure. Well, I'm curious, are there ever days when you sit down to write and the words aren't coming? And if so, what do you do? Oh, that's such a, that's such a good question. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I find that like, you know, it's, um, I think of myself as having two kinds of writer's block and one is I'm in the middle of writing something. And if the word, you know, I'm just really stuck and, and the, you know, something's really not coming to me. And, and I often find that just taking a break and going for a walk or a run, like, you know, just coming back to it, that's enough to kind of jiggle my brain and get something going. And but the tougher kind of writer's block for me is when I finish the work and I, I haven't really figured out what I'm going to do next. And I find like I really can't force it. I mean, I've tried to sit down and try to brainstorm and come up with ideas that I really can't force that I, I have to kind of wait for my subconscious mind to, you know, kick up like a, you know, 
an image or, a, you know, a, a dialogue or something that kind of prompts that, that, um, you know, my brain to get going on, on telling a new story. So, um, yeah, it's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> the latter one. <laughs> well, are you working on another novel now? Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I just, I just completed the revision of a paranormal suspense novel and um, it tells the story of a portrait artist and she moves into this house um, that was constructed by a 19th century architect whose work was said to influence the mind and that supposedly in beneficial ways. But soon she begins to have these really weird experiences in the house and she kind of worries that, you know, maybe I'm falling under the spell. And at the same time, she becomes entranced by a handsome next door neighbor who is a chemist and he starts brewing these uh, seemingly innocent herbal tonics for her and <laughs> we're supposed to help you know um, boost her creativity but you know they're starting to feel like they're having other influences and um all the while this is going on someone seems to be looking out for her and it's her housekeeper who may not be of this world so that's kind of a little bit of a gist of, of the story there that's great well what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels yeah, so uh, I'm I'm going to speak um, of novels here um, uh, in particular, and and probably a lot of the writers in your audience are already already doing this, and that's just to get a, a really generous amount of feedback on your first drafts. And for me, um, you know, I, I've looked to members of writers groups or you know fellow fellow writers whose opinions I really value, and gather all of their um, input and, um, you know, come up with a revision plan. And I find that like, inevitably, I just have blind spots on my, on my writing. And I really just need that um, sense of what, what isn't working and needs more development. And then I just get that first draft into as good a shape as possible. Um, and, you know, until it's ready, um, I think to, to be submitted. And for me personally, I mean, I think everyone's different about this, but I find that it's really helpful to for me to wait till I have a complete first draft before I have anyone look at it. Because in the past, um, I've had people look at, you know, individual, individual, individual chapters or partial manuscripts. And I find that, um, you know, it ends up sending me down rabbit holes of rethinking and doubt, and I just never get the first draft done. So for me personally, it's better to just wait until I have that first draft in hand before I get feedback. Sure. Well, you, you mentioned writing groups. How did you find your writing group? You know, it's funny. Um, one writing group that I had for years is um, was uh, it started at a um, you know Boston Center for Adult Education Fiction Writing Workshop years ago, and a few of us after the class just said, you know, we just really we just really hit it off in terms of you know we felt like our comments re resonated with each other, and we said, you know, why don't we form our own form our own um, writers group. And that group went on for years. I mean, people kind of came in and out and, we, and people rejoined it. And then from there, word of mouth about other folks who were interested in forming a group. So it was kind of like a little bit of a, you know, um, you know, just being part of the writing community and connecting with others who, you know, whose, whose opinions were really valued and whose work were really, really connected with. So. Sure. Hey, this is Jeff, the host of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. I have a company that I want to tell you about that I think you will definitely be interested in as a podcast listener. Family Sounds. Have you ever gone to a family reunion and traded stories and laughed with your relatives? And later you thought, gosh, I wish there was some way that we had a way to preserve those stories and preserve those memories um, when we're not face to face. Well, now you do with Family Sounds. Family Sounds can create an hour-long podcast that's just for you, that's just for your family, that tells the stories of your family and your relatives. And Family Sounds team, they're pros. They've done this before. They have lots of experience crafting stories for public broadcasting through radio and podcasts. They will use your family's voices as well as a professional narrator to tie the story together. Again, the name of the company is Family Sounds, and you can find them at family-sounds.com forward slash books. Again, that is family-sounds.com forward slash books. Family Sounds 
your memories, your family, in a podcast today. So check them out, family-sounds.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening. Are you on a search for a special holiday, a birthday gift for a reader in your life? A reader who loves history? Well, I've got a suggestion for you. How about giving them weekly historic letters in the mail from Letter Joy? Every week, they'll receive a letter from a famous historical figure or an eloquent eyewitness to a major event. Past Letter Joy letters have included famous defense attorneys, the United States and China, or working on the railroad, exploring the American history of the railroads. For example, one letter was an engineer writing home to his wife to describe the tough process of laying tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad. Every letter joy letter arrives at your door on fine stationery or parchment with a real stamp. And each letter also includes the postscript an article by expert curators on the latest letter and the historical figures and events connected to it. Visit letterjoy.co to give weekly historic letters to the historian in your life. And I have a special offer for listeners of this podcast. Use promo code BOOKS at checkout to get $5 towards your first order. Again, That's letterjoy.co, promo code books, to give a special gift to the reader in your life. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? You know, there are, there are many of them. Um, And I, I'll tell you one that I'm reading right now. Um, It's Love and Bullets by Nick Kolakowski. And um, it hasn't been published yet, but it's about to be published. And um, I actually, I, um, a side gig I have is I write reviews for my a website I have called smallpresspicks.com where I recommend um, new new fiction. And Nick's book is just a really exciting kind of uh, fast-paced thriller. And I'm, I'll be posting my review um, before too long at smallpresspicks.com if anyone wants to check it out. Sure. Well, when you were getting started writing, um, either, you know, very earlier, uh, were there were there initially authors or books that inspired you yeah so i'm trying to think like um is in my early i'm thinking about like um you know when i really really started seriously writing not just my um you know juvenile efforts mm-hmm. but when i was yep. a young young woman um starting out as a writer and it's interesting that you know story writers really um took me um you know one of my just all-time favorites is alice monroe who's just an you know as many of your audience um, members know, it's just just a wonderful writer of, of, of short story form, and um, I just I felt like I just learned so much from her. Not that my writing could you know could um, be compared to hers at all, but just sort of the idea of immersing herself herself in characters' minds and and you know into their world. So um, you know I could name many, but I would say she's just one of just one of my favorites of all time. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? Sure, sure. So probably the best place is my website, which is bethcastrodale.com. And, you know, that has information about my books. It has my my blog, if anyone wants to check that out. But that's probably the best place to start. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Beth Castrodale, author of the new novel, I Mean You No Harm. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Beth, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of I Mean You No Harm by Beth Castrodale, narrated by Christine Williams, available wherever audiobooks are sold. The Wake Reedstown, Ohio, 2019 Layla never imagined she'd see her father again. But here she was, staring into his lily-draped casket. The movie star looks that had hooked her mother were long gone. So was the figure from the courtroom sketches. 
expressionless except for the dark eyes brimming with what one reporter described as menace. That same reporter nicknamed him Thundercloud. So was the man Layla had last seen during that ill-fated road trip twenty years ago, when those same dark eyes seemed edged with regret. Heart disease, years of it, had killed him at the age of sixty-five. Not a bullet from a rival or a cop, the type of ending that part of her had always expected. The disease had bloated his features beyond familiarity to her, and the rose-colored lights trained on him, surely intended to suggest the flush of life, did nothing but broadcast that this was the location of a dead body, the one she and fifty-some other guests had filed into Parlor A of Hanlon Funeral Home to see. Someone tapped her shoulder. Layla? She turned and saw a hollow-cheeked figure in a pale green dress and white cowboy boots, her gray hair bottle-brushed short. Layla, it's Bet. Layla would have guessed the woman standing before her to be in her late forties at the youngest, but if she was remembering correctly, Bet was thirty-seven, just five years older than herself. Of course. Good to see you. The awkward question arose, unspoken, hug or not. Bet answered it by extending her hand. Layla shook it firmly but without breaking bones, her grandpa's old instructions. You too, Bet said. Bet barely resembled the teenager from the road trip. Back then, she'd had weight to her and thick shoulder-length brown hair. The only familiar feature was the half-smirk of a smile, as if she were about to say, you're full of shit. Bet nodded toward the casket. He'd be glad you made it. Would he? Based on her last encounter with her father, Layla wouldn't have assumed as much. Nor would she have assumed that Bet would ever want to see her again, half-sister or not. And given how things had gone on the road trip, Layla came to believe that Bet had caused every single bit of the trouble her grandparents used to discuss in low voices. But things were different now, or so it seemed. If Layla's recent phone conversation with Bet was to be believed, she was now a responsible single mother with an associate's degree and a steady job as a security guard. Even Bet's smile looked slightly different, the half smirk now suggesting some mutual understanding, as if she and Layla were in on the same ongoing joke. Age, maybe, was the only thing that could explain this. Ready to meet Marla and Jake? Sure, Layla said. She followed Bet away from their father's body, away from the cloying smell of lilies, toward a far corner of the room. On her drive to the funeral home, Layla envisioned an assemblage of stereotypical mobsters, thick-bodied thugs in cheap-looking suits or athletic wear, all of them flashing some type of gold chains, rings, or watches. As it turned out, a few attendees matched this description, but they were far outnumbered by ordinary-looking men and women, mostly middle-aged or older, with a few young adults and toddlers sprinkled here and there, presumably children or grandchildren of the mourners. Most guests looked like the ones who'd attended her grandparents' funerals. Still, as she and Bet made their way around and through the clusters of guests, Layla took in as many male faces as she could, just as she'd done on the way up to the coffin. She searched for anyone resembling the picture her mother had drawn years ago during one of her waitressing shifts. Any man with dark, downturned eyes and a widow's peak. Any man with a blank, yet devouring stare. Are you ready for spring San Antonio? Ready to explore the perfect mix of history, culture, and modern attractions for the whole family? Ready to experience the city's famous river walk for unforgettable dining, shopping, and sightseeing? Ready for a one-of-a-kind San Antonio spring? 
Are you ready to be safe and travel responsibly so we can all enjoy the spring season together? Plan your trip at visitsanantonio.com today. Those big wireless companies try to lure you in with a new phone just to lock you into a contract. Not Simple Mobile. If you have a great smartphone you love, you can get a powerful nationwide 5G network without the contract. Just text the word BYOP to 611611 to see if your phone's compatible. Simple Mobile. Out with the old, in with the simple. Message and data rates may apply. Visit simplemobile.com slash privacy policy for privacy policy and the terms and conditions at simplemobile.com slash terms and conditions. Compatible 5G capable device and SIM required. Actual availability, coverage, and speed may vary. 5G network not available in all areas. 5G upload speeds not yet available.